uh, is Callum Strong, Mount Maker Museum of New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand, and even the bird needs bones to fly. Hey tohu whakamahara tanga, kia ora, tonu te Aotearoa. Kia ora koutou, greetings to everyone. Thank you for the introduction and a massive thank you for the opportunity to present at the International Mount Makers Forum at the Kiti Centre today. I'd like to share with you a story about the artist Rolf Hotere from Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud, more commonly known as New Zealand and the challenges involved in mounting, transporting, and installing his work, Black Phoenix. It's a colossal installation of the remains of a burnt out fishing boat weighing 1,800 pound. It juts out from the wall and is flanked by charred timbers spanning 42 foot, etched back to reveal the natural timber below. For today's talk, I'll give you a quick introduction to the National Museum of New Zealand, where I've been mount making for the past 11 years. I'll give you some context to the artist and how Black Phoenix came into existence before we dive into the mount making process from design to installation. So I'd just like to start with acknowledging Te Papa Tongarewa, Container of Treasures, which is the National Museum of New Zealand. Te Papa is located in the capital city, Wellington, and much like Los Angeles, is situated on the Ring of Fire in a highly active seismic region. For those that follow Lord of the Rings might know it as Middle Earth, or more recently with the Rings of Power, Mordor. <laughs> the museum itself has base isolators in the foundations. The isolated bearings are made from rubber and steel layers with lead core. According to Wikipedia, a technology pioneered in New Zealand in the 1970s. Having experienced a few quakes in the museum, they definitely slow and dissipate energy, but almost prolong the shaking, so we still design mounts and support objects with earthquakes in mind, especially when lending objects to other institutions around New Zealand or when displaying exhibitions from overseas. Te Papa was founded on the principles of biculturalism in recognition of the founding document of the country, the Treaty of Waitangi. As a living document today, it still guides the relationship between Tangata Whenua, people of the land which the indigenous Māori, and Tangata Tiriti, people of the treaty. And this is important to recognise in the context of Rolf Hauteri and his works. Hauteri was one of the first indigenous artists to bridge the art world between Māori and European practices in the modernist era. The renowned New Zealand art historian Jonathan Mani Fioki said, Hauteri is at the forefront of mainstream New Zealand art history, but he is also an artist who stood outside New Zealand art history, both as a Māori and as one of the most cosmopolitan, sophisticated international artists New Zealand has ever produced. Te Papa plays a very important role as kaitiaki, its guardianship, in terms of his legacy. The Black Phoenix work is so seminal, we have a responsibility to make sure we are contributing to the scholarship around it, especially by providing it to other institutions. The origins of the Black Phoenix began on the 4th of October, 1984, in a small South Pacific boatyard in Carries Bay, Dunedin, located in the South Island when the 50-foot wooden fishing trawler, the Poit Trawl, was caught in a blaze. The fire was near Hauteri's studio, and apparently when he wandered down to investigate, a vision began to emerge, and he negotiated the purchase of her charred remains from the shipyard owner, Miller and Tonnage. Hauteri was later quoted about this work. It's called Black Phoenix, because Miller and Tonnage are gonna rebuild. Kahinga atu he tetikura, aramai he tetikura. When the fern frond dies, another takes its place, like the phoenix, like Miller and Tunnage. 
It's a really complex sculpture. Just the words charred and salvaged gives you some indication of the fragility and friability of the material, the hotary brought into this beautiful work, which speaks to the concepts of rebirth, regeneration, and reinvention, that whole idea of the phoenix rising from the ashes. Ralf Hotori passed away in 2013, and so a retrospective exhibition, Atete, to resist, was formulated by two galleries in the South Island, Christchurch and Dunedin. So just to provide some context, I'll play a quick showreel from the Christchurch Art Gallery. Hotori went on a scholarship at the age of 30 in 1961 to study at the London Central School of Art and Design, where he merged his own cultural roots into new forms of painting and sculpture. He took the time to soak up exhibitions in galleries and museums, encountering and being inspired by the darkness of Rembrandt and Goya, engaging in the modernist movement with the likes of Mark Rothko. He saw how spiritualism and abstraction could combine. So with his return to New Zealand, his own black painting style began to emerge with the Black Phoenix sculpture, the culmination of those ideas. And so while the Black Phoenix has been displayed a few times since its creation, the COVID pandemic created an opportunity for Te Papa staff to undertake a full collection care project, looking at the storage, transit, and installation of the work. The body of the Black Phoenix is actually comprised of two parts, 800 pounds for the power, 1,000 pounds for the prow section that are stacked together. 51 planks of timber lean up against the wall and lie across the floor. When the work was pulled out of storage, we could see that it had not been properly supported since the late 1980s. The bow section was on its back and the charred surfaces were badly exposed. At Te Papa, when we get together at the start of projects, we usually begin with a karakia, a prayer, and waiata, song, to unify those who are working with the collection object or taonga, treasure. This is part of what we call tikanga, traditional values and customs. A lot of Māori and Pacific collection is deemed to be living objects, and this can even influence how we do mounts, such as if a figure is carved into an object, making sure the mount isn't strangling the neck or gripping the groin. Some objects may even need to be easily removed from mounts if they are required for ceremonial roles. So here we are on the first day looking at the lower bow section, which is rather unceremoniously being stropped down to a pallet, causing the edges to flare out and crack. The collection project soon took over the conservation objects lab. As our objects conservator would say, we inhaled the boat. As literally over a couple of months, a fine black dust spread about the building as she did her best at consolidating loose parts, big cracks and splits in the timber. She identified areas that had been burnt from the fire and subsequent charring that Hotori had undertaken at his studio. She left the bird's nest that she found in the hull perhaps indicating the beginning of the phoenix's rebirth. The practical challenges of moving around such large pieces was no easy feat, and all planks were subsequently repacked into nested trays with mylar slip layers over foam, with each tray containing its own Ziploc bag to collect fragments and dust to help estimate loss per transit and installation. But the first part of the puzzle was looking at the original mounting solution and how they installed it. That's 80s fashion aside. The old documentation illustrated wires lashed around the lower part of the Samson post. It's usually the strongest part of the boat used for attaching mooring lines and anchors. A team of people would push the charred bow up against the wall while someone climbed into the hull to fix the wires back to the gallery wall. The top prow section was then balanced on top and the upper part of the Samson post fed through the deck to lock into the lower section below. While it made sense for Hotori to cut through the old fishing boat, the point trawl through its water line to make it into two manageable pieces, in a biblical kind of way that he also cut through the Samson post meant the boat had also lost its strength. The main fixing point for the Samson post was well decayed, had an inch of play around a single half inch bolt holding it down onto a knee. Essentially, once the prow section was placed on top, the boat was trying to pull itself apart at the single point. And I guess that's the juxtaposition of this work. The vessel on the dry at rest, 
but behind the scenes, the calculations suggest this is a ship at anchor in a howling 50-knot gale, such as the strain on the Samson Post and gallery walls. And indeed, the review of the old installation documentation spoke about one gallery wall failing under the strain and concrete reinforcement having to be added. Along with the visible internal damage to the boat, it wasn't hard to imagine a point where future failure was likely. He takina ko iwi e rere ai te manu. Even the bird needs bones to fly. This came to me one night while lying on the floor of the conservation lab with the bow still on its back. I was trying to picture the floor as the wall and extrapolate the myriad of angles and measurements required to make the bow section of Black Phoenix rise up. I guess as mount makers, our number one focus is to maintain the integrity of the artist's vision. It's not just the making we do, it's the conversations with curators and conservators to ensure we're all on board while we strive to keep mounts invisible, protect the artwork, make the install easy and safe. And indeed, when I proposed a new mount system, to Papa curator Megan Tamati Quinnell, who had met Ralph Holtere a number of times, told me that he loved mechanical engineering, had an obsession with cars, had even visited a Mercedes-Benz factory in Germany to source Mercedes-Benz black lacquer for his paintings. When it came time for the paint finish on the mounts, unfortunately, my budget didn't extend quite so far. So along with the crate maker, we began the design process. The idea was to design a mount that would integrate with the transit crate, utilizing the crate as a tool to replicate the installation process that would also remove any unnecessary handling of the charred surface and make install much safer. So starting with CAD, as we all know, that's actually cardboard aided design. I made up uh, four brackets per section that would clamp around what is called the stringers as these stringers were determined to be the most structurally sound part of Black Phoenix, being fastened to the ribs and hull planks themselves. And this gave me a reference point for the overall mount system. The first sketches gave me a sense of the internal space I had to contend with and how the mount might connect back to the wall. I knew it couldn't be fixed. The mount would require adjustment. I looked at different options. Brace checks, no. Slotted sliding segments. I decided on wall plates to clip onto and considered their spacing relative to any mounts and the space between the different parts of the boat. I questioned how the mount would interface with the crate. We also had to consider the loading, the moment around the base of the keel and finally settled on braced cantilevered arms connected via a split batten approach to wall plates made from 3 8 inch steel with enough wall anchors to resist pull-out in a seismic event. But the eureka moment came when I integrated turnbuckles and lifting eyes to the main components. Finally allowing for the internal spatial requirements and clearance for the Samson posts when it was fed back through. So with enough measurements, it was work top time, workshop time as the fabrication process became a dialogue of numbers and a dance between tolerance and precision. The brace cantilevered arms were made from three by two inch steel section and these connected the turnbuckles to a lifting structure that connected to the stringer clamps. And that was really the main challenge. The two massive parts had to line up, project out at the exact same eight degree angle, sit the whole structure tight to the wall as if the boat had just burst through, and finally connecting them together via a 5 8 inch kingpin that Holtedy had embedded into the stem post with zero margin for error. For the paint finish, we just had to settle for Mount Makers Black. You can see here the turnbuckle design, which allowed both <clears throat> bow and prow sections to be adjustable in all directions, tilting bow to stern and port to starboard. As the cantilevered arms stay still, 
the lifting cradle changes angle by pulling up or lowering down on each side. The moment of truth. We successfully flipped the old pallet up and the phoenix began to fly towards the new crate system ready for its final fit out. The prow section took a similar path but used M12 turnbuckles to deal with the extra 200 pound weight. For both sections, the turnbuckles had a 10 to 1 ratio of braking load to the mass of the boat, which was useful when lifting into place. The main consideration then was the rotation about the keel, and the braced arms and wall plates countered those rotational forces. So this is the lifting stage uh, of the prow section off the old pallets. We designed a lifting bar that locked into the mount through an opening in the deck. We set up a mock install in one of the corridors that had enough space. The wall bracing formed part of the specifications and layout plan that was sent onto the galleries so they could get an engineer to um, make sure everything was reinforced, signed off um, before we arrived. We lifted the bow section into place, which was a simple transfer to the crate to the wall, and then tested the prow section, discovering that the kingpin on the prow, that final crux move, was out of alignment with the corresponding hole in the bow. But with a few quick turns on the turnbuckles, it was with great satisfaction when it fit together perfectly. Crate maker driving the forklift, excuse his language, and hardly believed that it worked. But again, when installing at the two galleries, those fine adjustments on the turnbuckles that we could make uh, really helped with the non square walls and unlevel floors that we ultimately encountered. From there, the transit and installation process was relatively seamless. The final crate fit outs were completed. This is exhibit A, boat in a box. And the prow crate was nicknamed the landship after the World War I tank. Its dimensions are 10 foot wide and six and a half foot high and long. Here we have the final fitting out of the plank trays and stack for transit. Each tray weighed up to 200 pound. The stack weighed over a ton and there was actually two stacks. Here, arriving at the first venue showing before and after transit with minimal charcoal loss, which meant we had a very, very happy crate maker. The bow mount structure had removable lifting eyes, so we could strop up with either a forklift or gantry rig. Moving the prow section probably was the most scary part, as although it was super stable, just the mass at height while guiding into final position has made us consider a future upgrade. because you can see here just how tight it really fits together. And currently the only holding position was available through the small black square patch at the back left there. It's a remnant from some previous time. So perhaps in the future we've uh, thought of clip-on outriggers, so it may actually end up looking like a modern America's Cup uh, foiling monohull. And just to give you a sense of scale, with all the trays laid out, here we are mid-install at Dunedin Public Art Gallery as we began to install the planks. Uh, my other mount maker colleague took care of the vertical planks. Again, the old documentation had talked about an earthquake in the 1980s at a Wellington gallery. Originally, small wooden blocks had been fastened to the back of the timbers, and these had been double-sided taped to the floor and wall. Uh, you can imagine how completely inadequate this was, and the planks had moved, but fortunately hadn't fallen. Many of these old blocks had split, so removing these and replacing them with D-ring, J-hook system at the top and a hinge plate at the bottom was approved. The top D-ring mount proved to be tricky. It had to be down from the top where there was solid enough wood, as many had jagged and fragile tips. 
The timbers lean back against the wall, forming a right angle triangle. As we didn't have a high enough stud um, in our conservation lab, we had to form a horizontal jig stand uh, to set the foot of each plank at the same apparent distance from the wall when they would finally be installed. Uh, the fittings also helped with being able to lift from the D-ring at the top during installation and help reduce the handling of the charred surface. With so much time with the work, we really came to admire Hotori's selection of timbers, as despite their jagged and crumbly exterior, the hardwood below exposed as golden honey hues, as in such great condition the work should surely endure for a long time. And while Hotori was notoriously silent about his own work, some perspectives have emerged. When laid on the floor, the planks lead the viewer as if across the sun glowing water to the upraised prow of the boat itself. The charred timbers stacked against the wall on either side of the prow resemble the ribs of a palisade surrounding a traditional Pao village. The colonial ship has crashed through. Perhaps the stripped back sections of timber suggest the surviving heart. The name of Hotori's tribe, Te Opuri, can be translated as dark smoke. The story is told of ancestors who, when under attack from another tribe, torched their own pa to escape under the cover of the smoke. As Aotearoa New Zealand ventures into a post-colonial world, the ship and planks together outstretched become reborn as the mythical phoenix that has survived the fires of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. Um, we have a couple of virtual questions. Back to the conservation. Uh, what was used to consolidate the charred sections? Uh, that would be a really good question for Numa our conservator. Um, but yeah, I do have some photos somewhere of her. She's injecting something. I wouldn't know what it was. Um, there was a bit of cleaning as well that she did, um, getting rid of just um, surface dirt as opposed to charcoal. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't answer that, sorry. It's a, kind of a two-parter. Um, can you, or the, the internal structure of the mount is permanent in the piece now, correct? Uh, it could be removed. Um, uh, yeah. Can you talk about how it's attached? Yeah, so if I describe, um, the stringers are the long planks that run the length of the boat. And so there's four clamps um, on those stringers they go back to a lifting structure, then you have the turnbuckles, and then you have the arms. So essentially the boat is floating kind of on the turnbuckles, so that whole section is adjustable. Yeah. We have a virtual two-parter. Did the artist leave any directions for the mounting of this work, and was the old documentation created by the artist? Um, no, it wasn't. That was from um, some of the original installs that I managed to track down through the archives. Um, he did leave some notes as to the arrangement of the planks, depending on the venue, because some of the planks of timber are um, close to six metres tall, so if the gallery couldn't have that kind of ceiling height, then they could be swapped out to the floor with shorter planks to the wall. How was the work originally stored? Um, so as you saw, there was basically just put on some pallets to ship around. Um, it had a kind of a, a loose kind of frame and some plastic sheeting over it. Um, so yeah, it, it was really in need of some, some love. Um, it had been in storage for quite some time. Um, and then just these sporadic installs over the years where people had sort of just followed that kind of original and sort of way of doing it. And anyone who I talked to who had worked on it told me it was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Um, and just really dangerous too. So, yeah. uh, in the planks where the wooden blocks had been removed, is the, were the original holes where you tried to reattach those hinges at the bottom? Yeah, that's correct. So um, where there were original holes, um, that's what we tried to do because um, interventions like that are usually a big no-no. 
um, but it was deemed in terms of the earthquake kind of risk for them falling that we actually had to do something. Um, and so there was also um, one previous install, I did come across some notes that um, someone had made some actual clamp mounts to go around the timbers and that was when Rolf Holtery was still alive. When he came to view the work, uh, he completely rejected them. He said, no, get rid of them. So um, we had to do something that was behind them um, and keep it as minimal as possible. Uh, the D-rings, were those also already placed or? Uh, no, so the, so the D-rings um, was where we could, where there were the old wooden blocks, we'd put them in the, in the same place. Thanks very much.